Now, if you have your Bibles and you're ready to go, and you got your message notes out, if you're just now joining us, we are walking through the Gospel of Matthew one passage at a time. And what we've been doing is, is we're going through God's Word, and in order to keep the theme of what we're doing, we have actually divided up the Gospel of Matthew into different seasons. And so to kind of catch you up for the few of you who are still kind of getting with us on this, what we did was, is we said that in season one, the first four chapters, it was the origin story of Jesus, and that is that He is the rightful King, and He came in power to rescue all of us. And it was amazing, man, as we ended our, our season, man, Jesus was going through the countryside, healing people, collecting disciples, moving party with Jesus. But then as we turned the page from chapter four to chapter five, Jesus literally paused, went on the hillside, and he started turning this upside down world right side up again. And he started teaching us slowly about what it looks like to be in the kingdom of God. And he, he did that because everybody you know has a private battle nobody else knows about. Look at your neighbor and say, he's still talking about you. He is. I is. We are. Even the, the sweetest grandmother you know has got at least one private battle she's working through right now. But the great thing is, is that Jesus knows. And he wants you to walk in freedom every single day. And so season two, the whole idea, we, we called it the message. We could have called it soul therapy. It's about the foundation of the kingdom of God is an unshakable joy that slowly grows from the bottom up. It's, it's crock pot, not microwave on what happens. And at the end of season two, Jesus looked around and he said, who's going to help me spread this good news? Well, as once again, we turn the page from chapter four to chapter, excuse me, from chapter seven to chapter eight. That's not true. Chapter nine to chapter 10. Does it matter really? Not really right now. It's just me being a little OCD right now. But what we found out is that we were the plan that Jesus has. That is, as we follow Jesus, he empowers us to make a difference. And then we talked about how Jesus led us through that. And then as we went through season three, we noticed that a divide was starting to happen. You had those who were walking with Jesus and growing in him, and you had others who were opposing Jesus. And now they're outright against him. And as we turn the page finally over into season four, one of the things that we started to realize is that Jesus isn't gonna let his detractors stop him from continuing to grow his followers because he wants us to go even deeper into knowing who he is because it changes everything else. And so season four, the big idea is that the kingdom of heaven isn't just a joy, but it's also a spiritual reality that changes how we see everything else. And so what we've been saying is, is we live in the world of five senses. And we live on what we can see, taste, smell, touch, and all the different things. But the, thing, the reality is, is that all around us is a spiritual reality. And even though we can't see it, even though we don't always encounter it with our five senses, it's just as real as what we can see. It's like the wind. You don't see it when it's, when it, when it's moving, but you see the effects of it all over the place. And that God is moving in so many ways that we can and that we can't see. And so the more we learn about Christ, the more we have what the Bible calls take on the mind of Christ, and we are conformed into his character and we look more like him, the more we're able to see what he's doing, then it changes how we see everything else. And kind of the enduring image is the idea of, of going to the optometrist. And like that optometrist who puts that ridiculous contraption on your face. And once again, he starts asking us, what's better, one or two? three or four, it's kind of the same thing except the other way around. Jesus say, is saying, look, one is better than two. Three is better than four. And he's helping us to slowly begin to see. And as we begin to see what Jesus is doing and how he processes the world, the more we're able to see everything else. And then we first started the season, Jesus told all these wonderful parables, which are complex spiritual principles wrapped in story. And then after he did that, he started walking through things. And then today, what we're gonna see is, is we're gonna see one of the most, and I know I've been saying this, but we just keep coming up against them so much, one of the most debated passages in the entire New Testament. We're gonna read some of this very controversial, there's a lot of different ideas, and so we're just gonna get down to exactly what it says, because if we can get down to exactly what God's word says, it is absolutely phenomenal what he is telling his disciples. And it reminds me of something that happened in my family's life back several years ago. And that is uh, several years ago, my girls were much smaller. Uh, we had saved up some money and we had planned and prepared and we were finally gonna take them on their first big trip. Like it was awesome. We were so excited and we told them about it and we rah rah and got excited. And then the, the morning came and we were, we were ready to go. And, and man, one of the first things we had to do was we had to get on an airplane. 
And I mean, it was, it was something that was like, it was, it was fun and it was exciting, but it was also nerve wracking and different. And, and Autumn sat in one place with one of our daughters and I sat in another place with my other daughter. And man, they was just so excited about what was gonna happen. Well, it was exciting and, and in kind of a way, but on the other side, it was horrible. It's a horrible flight. We ended up sitting beside someone who's just nasty and terrible and, and, and wouldn't, wouldn't stop talking. You ever been have one of those kind of people? Just ruin the whole flight. As a matter of fact, when they weren't paying attention, I took a picture and you can see this was the picture of who was sitting beside us the whole time. <laughs> I'm just on a roll talking about cats every week, so I couldn't resist one more time. It just wouldn't, actually the whole, the truth is, that's a lot. The truth is it was a wonderful flight. Everything was great. And as we got off the airplane and we're kind of walking through the terminal and everything, that daughter looked at me and she said, dad, that was a wonderful trip. That was just great. What a wonderful trip we have had. And I started to realize, wait a minute, I think she thinks that was the whole trip. <laughs> like she thinks we've landed back in Nashville again, I think, and then we're just gonna get our baggage and go home now. That was the trip. And I was looking at her and I was going, I sure hope that's not true. <laughs> And I, so I was able to tell her as only I can in my Southern draw, I've just kind of gotten used to it. And that is this, and I said, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet, okay? <laughs> Because that's how we say it in Alabama. We don't say, you haven't seen a thing yet, my friend. We don't do that. <laughs> Baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. And can I tell you, that's just true. What Jesus is going to tell them today is a very first century, very creator of the universe kind of way of just basically saying, bros, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yeah, let's watch what he has to say, and we're going to dive into this. I can't wait to share God's word with you. God's word says this. It says, when, the, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of of the living God. And then Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you forbid will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Wow. There's so much there. And actually, what was going on is, is everything from John chapter 11, when John the Baptist actually sent some of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? Are you the son of man? Are we looking for somebody else? This has all been culminating to this point right here that we can look at all of this. And this is the big moment when Jesus finally reveals who he is. And actually from chapter 16 and chapter 17, there's actually a, some moments that occur that is a right turn. It's a linchpin of the entire gospel of Matthew that everything starts to change after this moment right here when Jesus says who he is. And that's why there's been hundreds of books written on this passage because it's so important and so pivotal in the life of Jesus and in the, the gospels that, that are there with what's going on. And so obviously we're not gonna be able to cover all the nuances that are here, but we wanna cover the big idea. And what I wanted to do with this, and I didn't do this, but what I wanted to do for our big idea for today is I wanted it to be that Jesus opens our eyes to see the bigger, overwhelming, huge, gigantic, massive, amazing, awesome, stupendous picture. But that's a lot of words, okay? So instead, just say, Jesus opens our eyes to see the bigger picture, okay? That's, that's better, right? Because what he's doing is, is he is pausing for a moment. And he's saying, now guys, I need y'all to understand something. Because he knows that everything is about to pivot and everything is about to change. And, and we're getting really close to when Jesus is gonna go to Jerusalem and he's gonna be crucified and he's gonna rise from the dead. We're only just a little while away from that when it comes to where this is happening in the timeline of Jesus. So he needs them to see the bigger picture. And what he's gonna tell them and what it's gonna help us grapple with today is the kingdom question of, I gave my life to Christ, I'm following him. What happens now? What happens now that I'm following Jesus. And I think what Jesus would say to us is, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. Look at your neighbor and say, I know that's right. I'm going to teach y'all how to, how, to, how to praise the Lord Southern style before this is over with. Come on, look at somebody else and say, come on, I know that's right. 
You ain't seen nothing yet. That's what Jesus is trying to tell him. And this, this is what he's teaching us is number one, is that as we follow Jesus, he opens our eyes to truly know who he is. To truly know who he is. And he's telling them, hey, you haven't seen anything yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. You've just seen a glimpse, just a, just a little bit, just a smidge of a hair, you know, just a little bit of what I am and what I can do. And what we're going to do as well is, is because this passage has been so just talked at and looked at that a lot of times it's lost its meaning. And so there's actually three landmines in this text that a lot of times because of the way it has been portrayed, that there's kind of got a misunderstanding that's lost some of the beauty of this text. And I've actually watched good friends of mine, and, and I might have, may or may not have been guilty about this before, that there's so many landmines in this text that they'll just kind of sneak over here and kind of avoid that right there. Well, man, this is real life church. So we're just going to step right on them and just talk about them today. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So here's the first thing that Jesus said is he said, when he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples. Now, first of all, that's amazing because Caesarea Philippi was known in the area as being the epicenter for that whole region for idolic worship. They would worship the pagan deities there. The number one uh, false god they would worship there was Pan. And they would go and they would worship those false gods. And Jesus takes them away from their other environment, gets them off by themselves. And he says, okay, now we're all by ourselves. We're in a place full of villains. Let me ask you a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, the Son of Man, he's speaking about himself. That was an Old Testament reference to the Messiah. He's saying, who do people say that the Messiah is? Well, they say, some say Johnny B, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, and one of, or one of the other prophets. But then he says, but who do you say that I am? That's the important thing. And then G, uh, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And so what's happened is, is already in this text, there's a landmine that we're just going to kind of step on because when this is looked at a lot of times, what it tends to, to do is it tends to, to help us uh, figure out the problem of sometimes people will say that salvation is believing in Jesus. Like that's, there, there's this horrible landmine that slowly has happened where people say, if you just believe in Jesus, that's what salvation is. Some of you right now, don't even nod your head because I don't want you to feel bad in a minute, but some of us think that that's what salvation is. It's believing that Jesus existed. Can I tell you the truth? The Bible teaches us that even demons believe in Jesus and they tremble. That there are demons that believe Jesus more than we do because some of us believe in Jesus, but it doesn't make us nervous or in awe. But when the Bible says that demons know and they're terrified. And so they know Jesus exists, but that doesn't save them. And so the reality is, is that that's what they were starting to do with, with Jesus, is they were saying, he said, hey, who is the son of man? And they're like, well, he's kind of important. He's a big deal, but how big of a deal is it? So they actually start saying, this is what the crowd says. They say, well, first of all, some say he's John the Baptist, which means not you. Like, like that actually Johnny B was the Messiah and somehow or another, even after you died, you've kind of become him. So you're not really the Messiah. You're pretty important, but actually this, the Messiah was Johnny B. The second one they said is it's Elijah. And this is when you don't know because it was very common in the Jewish culture at the time because it was one of the last verses in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament that said when the time of the Messiah was gonna come, that someone in the spirit and power of Elijah was gonna come and he was gonna prepare the way. So if you didn't know what else to say, you said Elijah. So this is where they are saying, we don't exactly know who you are, but we don't know if you're him. We just think that maybe you're the guy who's gonna prepare the way for him. And then the third one is Jeremiah. Now, the reason why they would have said Jeremiah is, according to an Old Testament historical book called the Maccabees, they believed that right before the nation of Babylon came in and overthrew Jerusalem, we're going to be reading about this in our, our, um, our soap over the next several weeks, right before uh, the nation of Israel, or excuse me, Jerusalem was destroyed, it is believed that, that Jeremiah came and he went and he hid the Ark of the Covenant and the altar of incense so that the invading armies would not get a hold of these sacred objects. And some people believe that he hid it under the temple mount. We don't really know if that's true and if he did. But it was believed that when the time of the Messiah was coming, that someone in the spirit and power of Jeremiah would return, would restore the articles of the temple and usher in the kingdom. That's a pretty important person. And so they're going, we think you're pretty important, but we don't really know what to do with you. 
And here's the reality. If the landmine is that salvation is believing in Jesus, the truth is, is that salvation is actually what you do with Jesus. Salvation is a miracle from God, and it is when you declare Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, and he becomes your king. That's the truth. That's the difference between what they were doing and what Peter did, because they were saying, you're super important. We believe that you're here. We believe you got a lot going on. But it was Peter that actually said, you're not just important. You are the Messiah, but you're also the son of the living God. He went from, you're a savior, to he said, you're a savior and you're the king. And that's what got Jesus' attention. That was the moment when everything changed. And he said, okay, that's the point. That's the big deal. And can I tell you, that's the big deal for us. It's not enough to believe that Jesus existed. It's not enough to believe that Jesus takes away the sins of the world. What really happens is when we take that and we make it personal to ourselves. That's why the Bible says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. And so salvation is not just about what you believe, but it's what you do with what you believe. And when you take that on and you say, yes, he is my savior and he is my Lord and I declare him as my king, that's when the power of God changes our life. Can I tell you, it's broken my heart so many times when I've talked to people who would, would come to our church or go somewhere else and they would give their life to Christ and then later they would tell me, it just didn't work for me. Christianity didn't work for me. And you know, there's probably a thousand reasons why that is, but one of the reasons why so many times it happens is they become acquainted with the Savior, Jesus, but they never make him their Lord. And so they say, Jesus, I don't wanna go to hell, so, so rescue me from hell, but I'm not gonna give you my life. And so therefore the power of God is when he doesn't just become your savior, but he also becomes your Lord and he becomes your king. And when that happens, that's when God's word says, God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the things, good things we have done. And none of us can boast about it. And look what it says. And it says, because we are his masterpiece. And he created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And that's what salvation is. It's not just believing in, it's trusting on him. I don't just believe that he's the savior of the world. I believe and trust that he's the savior of my world. And he now becomes my king. And that's what it is to be saved. And that's also what baptism is. Baptism is when we tell the world what we have declared inside of us. And that's one of the reasons why I love baptism so much. And I know uh, we've got one coming up on Easter. And one of my favorite, there's so many, like there's a thousand memories. One of my favorites is this one right here. I love that. As a matter of fact, they're sitting beside each other back there right now. It's when Eric Leach baptizes Colton. And I don't know if you were there, but he baptized him and he kept him under there for like four minutes. It was a miracle he survived. That's not true. That's not true at all. But that wonderful opportunity when we're able to, to celebrate this, not just as even as a church family, but as individuals to realize that what baptism is, is when we say, Jesus is my king, and I wanna tell the whole world about it. I wanna let everybody know what happened on the inside of me, that when I confessed with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and I trusted him with my salvation, I became new from the inside out. And it was just like when I went down into the water and I came back up again. And that's why the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus is greater than we can imagine. Jesus is greater than we can imagine. And the longer we get to know who he is, and the longer that he isn't just our savior, but he becomes our Lord, the more we get to see him for who he truly is. It reminds me of when I was a teenager and I got baptized. Uh, it was this wonderful night and I got baptized and a few other people got baptized with me. And, and my, dad was, uh, my dad was my pastor when I was growing up. And he always would say this, this statement and he would always do this and no one ever took him up on it. But as soon as we were done, before he would transition, he would say, anybody else wanna get baptized? The water's wet. And I'm always like, what is that even? Of course it's wet. We didn't know what it meant, you know, but that was just his thing. That was his way of saying anybody else. Well, this particular night when I got baptized, he says, anybody else want to get baptized? The water's wet. 
And there was a gentleman sat about in this area. His name, only knew him as Brother Lambert. I'm sure he had a first name. I never knew it. His first name was Brother. Okay, that's all I knew. And he went, praise the Lord, Brother. I'm on my way. And this guy, and now when you're, when you're 15, everybody's old. You know what I mean? So he probably wasn't 103 years old, but I thought he was. You know, he had to be pushing 80, all right? And he was like, Brother, I'm on my way. Well, I kind of still remember my dad going, Okay, because no one ever took him up on that before. And he comes running up there. This older gentleman comes running up there. And the best of my memory, my dad never got a chance to baptize him. He gets in that water, praise the Lord, dunks himself and comes back up again. <laughs> Everybody's like, what is going on here? What is, what is happening? And I remember just water going everywhere. My dad didn't know what else to do, but just laugh. We were all just like, praise the Lord, what just happened here? You know? And so he gets out of the water and finally everybody gets done laughing. And we said, Brother Lambert. What in the world? Because he was one of the most godly men I'd ever met. I know he'd been baptized before. And he said, I just want to tell all these young folks, I, I have known the Lord for 50 years. And for 50 years, he has done nothing but good for me. I, every day it gets better and it gets better and it gets better. And I just want to remind everybody that he is still the Lord of my life. And the more I get to know him, the greater he becomes. And we were like, praise the Lord, me too. I mean, it, it was amazing. And can I tell you, that's what it is to be in the kingdom of God. That's why we say, man, you've given your life to Christ, man, you ain't seen nothing yet. Walk with him for a little while and watch what happens in your life. And Jesus knows I got to help you see the bigger picture. It's not just about the here and the now. It's about everything that I'm doing. And I want you to see what else is going on. And the first one is, is that when we follow him, he helps us to see the bigger picture of knowing who he truly is, that he is greater than we can imagine. The second thing he's teaching us is that as we follow Jesus, he opens our eyes to truly grow in freedom and become part of his spiritual family. Look at your neighbor and try it on for size and say, you ain't seen nothing yet, baby. <laughs> Didn't feel right, did it? Especially if that's a stranger, you don't wanna call him baby. It's weird, all right, don't do that. Maybe you cut that part off next time, all right. But watch, watch what happens as he's saying that, all right. He's saying this, he's saying, I say to you, Pete, which means rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the powers, the most literal translation is gates. And we're gonna talk about in a second. The powers of the gates of hell will not conquer it. Now, we didn't stepped on one landmine. Let's just go ahead and hop on another one, a real big one. There's a real big landmine here because the question becomes, and it's divided entire denominations, who's the rock? What's the rock going on? There's three different ideas behind this. And here, here it is, and you're gonna see the difference. Number one, the big landmine is that Pete himself is the foundation. He is the massive rock because, and this is what Catholics say, that he became the leader and the first Pope. So he, be, he is the rock that, that Jesus built his entire church on Pete and he became the first leader in, in uh, Jerusalem. And because of that, that's why they think that the Popes are infallible is because they carry the authority and the anointing of Peter. That's, that's what they believe. Turns out it's not true. I'm sorry for Catholic, but it turns out it's not true. But that's what they think, okay? Peter wasn't even the first pastor in Jerusalem. That was James the Just, Jesus' half-brother. But anyway, the second one is that the rock is Pete's profession was the foundation. That it wasn't Pete himself, but it was the profession that Jesus is the living one, the living son of God. And that, that profession is what but the, the church was gonna be built on. The third one is Jesus is the foundation and Pete's confession makes him and all who would come after part of the church. That's the one, by the way. That's, that's the one that actually is the point. And if you don't believe me on that, let's ask Pete. Wouldn't it be great if we could ask Peter? Like, Peter, what do you think Jesus meant when he said that? Turns out we can. Peter actually wrote about it when he was writing to the church in Rome, and he said this. He said, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people but he was chosen by God for great honor and you are living stones. Look at your neighbor and say living stones. You are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. You are a chosen people. And so what he's actually saying is he's saying this. He is saying that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone and that he himself, his profession made him part of the church that he was building, part of the family of God. Another way we know this is because that word, Peter, the, the, the Greek word, the Petros, actually means little stone. The next thing that Jesus said is, is on this rock is a different enunciation of the word rock, which means bedrock, foundation. 
that Peter, you're a, you're a, a little stone that's gonna be part of something absolutely huge and that you're gonna be able to be part of this. And why that's so important is it wasn't just for Peter. But now when you profess Christ and when another person professes Christ and your neighbor professes Christ, all of a sudden the kingdom of God starts to be built and we're all part of the family. But what's even more amazing is it's not just what happens in our church or even in our community, but all over the world and all throughout time, you're part of something so much bigger than you can imagine. All the way from Peter and Paul, all the way to us today, we're part of a spiritual family that spans 2,000 years. And you're part of that, that God sees you as somebody that is worthy of being part of his family. And what's amazing is that after Peter said, you're living stones, he said, guess what that makes you? That makes you a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, we can show others the goodness of God because he called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. He's made you part of his spiritual family and he's building us into his body. An amazing thing. But what's even more amazing is notice he said, and I say to you, I, Jesus said, I'm gonna build my church and the powers or the gates of hell will not conquer it. The reason why that's so amazing is at the place where they are. Remember, they're in Caesarea Philippi. And where they are is the paganistic center for that region. And the paganistic people of that area thought there was a cave system that, that was there. And they thought that the cave system was the very gates of the underworld. They thought that that was the very gates of hell. And so he's standing in the place where the pagans thought the gate of hell was. And I can't help but wonder if Jesus was meeting with those disciples and he's looking right over their shoulder at one of those cave entrances and he says, guys, I know you've got an enemy and I know that you think he's awesome, but I'm looking right at the gates of hell and said, it ain't got nothing on me. <laughs> that I am more powerful than anything that the enemy wants to throw against you. He's in the very place, the epicenter of what they thought were the gates of hell. And he says, come at me, bro. <laughs> you got nothing on me. And so God's word tells us this, that because of who he is, he is the spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom has already been bought for us on the cross. And when Jesus rose again, the Bible says he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and he gave them to us. And he said, now you don't have to live in bondage anymore. But all of us reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like him, and we are changed into his glorious nature. What does that mean? That means that Jesus has more power than we can imagine. He has more power. He has so many enemies, but no rivals. Nobody can actually do anything to him. That he looks at the very gates of hell, and he says, you got nothing on me because I am the king of kings. And Jesus is wanting them to see the bigger picture. The question, I gave my life to Christ, now what? Man, you ain't seen nothing yet. That you just scratched the surface of all that Jesus wants to do. And he said, I want you to see the bigger picture so that no matter what comes your way, you know. And the bigger picture is number one, that he wants us to see him for who he truly is, that he's greater than we can imagine. That he wants us to see that he has given us the opportunity to be part of a generational spiritual family and that we can walk in freedom. We're only as bound as the lies we're willing to believe, but it's because of him that we can be free. The third thing he teaches us is that as we follow Jesus, he opens our eyes to truly share the joy of his salvation with others. That he gives us the opportunity to truly share in the joy of his salvation with others. One more time, look at your neighbor and say, you ain't seen nothing yet. Don't say baby. I heard some of you say baby anyway. I hope you knew him, okay? Because if you don't, now it's weird, okay? You ain't seen nothing yet, baby, all right? Because this is what he said. This is, this is another landmine. The Bible says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Now, what in the world does that mean? Now, this is a landmine because there's def definitely layers to what this means. Now, the first thing we, we know, and the reason why this opens the door for all of us, is that word keys. Like, what does that mean? Well, actually, it was considered a position of honor if you were given the keys to the king's palace because you are the one who gave access to everybody else. And so primarily, we know that he's talking to Peter because it was Peter that in Acts chapter 2, was able to open the kingdom of heaven to all the Jewish people after the Holy Spirit descended. And he said, the door has been opened to all of you. 
And then it was in Acts chapter eight that Peter was the first one to then open the door to the Gentiles and to say the kingdom of God has now been open to everybody all over the place. And so one of the things we know immediately is that that is exactly what the primary meaning could be, is that he was the one that was given the honor of opening the kingdom of heaven to everybody. But the problem comes with the next part of it. Because if that's what happened to Peter, and remember Peter was an example to us that now we're all part of that, that means that then the keys to the kingdom, sharing the gospel and opening the door has now been given to us so that we've been given the honor to share the gospel with others. What does the next part mean? And it's another one of those landmines because this has been so taken and, and unintentionally twisted and things. And I think that what happens a lot of times is you get 1% off. And so for a long time, you don't know until it gets way out there. And what it actually happens is it actually creates this landmine of God cannot do anything without our permission. That he's sitting there and he's handcuffed himself and that God can't do anything until you tell him he can. I've heard people say that. That God is basically, like you hold him hostage. <laughs> that you, gotta, you have to say something or God's not gonna do anything. But the reality is, that's not what the text says. The most literal, direct translation of that text actually is, whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. Whatever you, yeah, we will have been permitted in heaven. So in other words, Jesus isn't saying, I'm waiting up in heaven and if somebody will just believe me, if somebody will give me permission, then I will enact my will on the earth. That's not what he's saying at all. Actually, what he's saying is, is I will lead so that you can follow. The authority begins in heaven and he prepares the way for all of us. In other words, he's saying that when you go and you open the kingdom to everybody else and when you tell them about my goodness, I am gonna lead the way. And before you ever even get started, I'm gonna start making a road for you. Whatever you bind on earth will have already been started in heaven. We don't start the good news. We just have the honor of sharing the good news with everybody else. It's Jesus that leads the way. We have the honor and the privilege of then stepping into what he's already giving us the opportunity to do. What a wonderful blessing it is to know that my king is not waiting on me. Instead, I get to follow him into the harvest field and he's already made a way for us to do the things that he's called us to do. So how do we do that? What does it look like to bind and loose based on what he's already bound and loosed in heaven? I think the most wonderful place to go look at this is actually where this verse comes from. Most scholars believe that Jesus wasn't just talking about the keys of the kingdom out of nowhere, but he was quoting a verse in the book of Isaiah that actually tells us what that looks like. He said it like this, that Isaiah says, I will give him the key to the house of David, the highest position in the royal court. You notice God's word says that you are his ambassador. You know what an ambassador is? It's the highest ranking official sent from one country to the next. And that's what God has called you to be. And that when he opens the door, no one will be able to close them. When he closes the door, no one will be able to open them. He will bring honor to his family name. That's the name of Christ. For I will drive him firmly in place like a nail in the wall and they will give him great responsibility and he will bring honor to even the lowliest members of his family. In other words, God has given us the great gift of opening the kingdom of God by sharing the kingdom of God with others. And what does that look like? The, God's word just told us is that number one, he is gonna open the doors. That as we pray and we move through every open door and we ask God to give us opportunities, he is the one who softens hearts. He is the one who opens the way so that he opens the doors. Number two is that he will give us a firm foundation. What happens when you take a nail and you, you hammer it into the wall? You can put your shirt on it, you can put a towel on it, you can put something on it, why? Because it's not going anywhere. It's a solid thing. He said, I'm gonna plant you in the house of God and your foundation to me is gonna be so solid that you're gonna be able to stand whatever is leaned on you. Whatever happens, you're gonna be able to make it. And then the chance to share is an honor for all, that all of us have the opportunity, even what, who would ever consider themselves to be the lowliest member of his family is given great honor and responsibility and honored for each one to reach one, for each one to then share the gospel with everybody else, to realize that binding and loosing and following after him is not for the elite, it's for all. And then we all have the opportunity to share in the honor of sharing God's word with others. 
It reminds me of, when I think about it, it reminds me of what we're going to be reading this week. Actually, I think it's tomorrow. And if you're reading God's Word with us, I thank you so much for, for reading 2 Kings. It's been, it's been awesome. Today's was kind of weird, but it was great. And it's going to be fine. If you haven't listened to it yet, spoiler alert, it's weird. Okay, but, that, but they're going through a lot right now. And tomorrow is going to be even more interesting because there is a siege that starts to happen where there is this kingdom that's trying to destroy is, uh, Jerusalem. And one of the ways they would do that is they would just wait you out. They would cut off all food, they cut off all water, and they just wait for you to give up. And they're getting close to giving up. And there's this moment that happens tomorrow, and I can't wait for you to read it. Uh, the Bible says that there were these, these uh, lepers. And if you had leprosy, you were just quarantined from the people and you just waited to die. And so they're on the outside of the city, and they're waiting to die. And finally, these lepers say, hey, look, we, if, if we stay here, we're going to die. If we go over to the enemy camp, we're probably going to die. But we might could steal some food first, maybe do something. Let's, we're, we're not doing any worse. So why don't we go ahead and go and see what, what can happen? Well, the Bible says that they go over to where the enemy is encamped and they realize nobody's there. God's already worked a miracle and they've already had to flee in the middle of the night and the, everything's empty. They were in such a hurry. They left their food on the stove. They left their phones on the charger. They left everything. They just got out of town. And so you imagine these lepers who they're already about to starve to death. I mean, they are, they are I mean, you gotta be pretty close to starving to death before you purposely walk into an enemy camp just to see, you know, just maybe, right? And so they kind of walk in and they go, wait a minute, nobody's thrown anything at us yet. You know, um, no one's arrested us. Hey, that looks like some fried chicken right over there. Um, I don't see anybody. And they, they go and they just start eating. They start putting on their new clothes. They start doing whatever. They realize, man, they are kings. And as they are there, and as they have now been saved, and they got all the food they could ever want, finally they look around at each other and they go, you know, this is not right. Here we are. This is a good day. This is good news. And we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait until tomorrow, some calamity might fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. And so they go back and they tell people, Hey, listen, I know you don't want to talk to me. I know, but from one beggar to another, there's life over there. Come and let me tell you the greatest news ever, and that is you don't have to die, but there's life just across the way. You know what I think about when I think about sharing my hope with somebody else? Is from one beggar to another, there's life. If you're willing to just take a step and to take a chance, it's already not working for you where you are. Why not try Jesus? And can I tell you, one of the greatest hopes I have for you, the reason why our focus this year is for each one to reach one, is because one of the greatest joys is when we realize that Jesus is worth sharing more than we can imagine. That he is worth sharing more than we can imagine. And my hope for you is that one day this year, if it hasn't already happened, that one day this year, you're going to be sitting across a coffee table or maybe sitting across a dinner table or, or, or talking to somebody you work with or wherever you're going to be, and you're going to be sharing your hope because God has opened the door and he's given you that firm foundation and you start sharing your hope. And all of a sudden you see the Holy Spirit working in that person's life. And they realize that Jesus doesn't just love the world. He loves them. And they give their life to Christ. And I hope for everybody here, if you've never experienced it, that you get to see light come into somebody's eyes. And you get to see them go from darkness to light. It's one of the greatest miracles I can ever tell you about. It's one of the best things in the world. When you see somebody's eternity changed and that you got to be the messenger of the good news of Jesus and you start realizing this is what life's all about. It's not about everything else. All that stuff is good and important, but the most amazing thing is when you watch another beggar come and find life and you get to see them and you all of a sudden realize that Jesus is worth sharing more than we can imagine. And that doesn't mean life is perfect, but I'm so much better than I was without him. You ought to try it and watch what the Lord does. And that's what Jesus is doing as he is saying, man, you got to see the bigger picture. It's about so much more than what you can imagine. And what you don't even realize is that, man, when you start to learn who I am, you realize that I am greater than you've ever thought possible. When you start to grow and realize you're part of a spiritual family and that freedom is yours, you don't have to be bound up to anything anymore, but you can walk in freedom. You realize he is more powerful than you can imagine. And then when you start to realize the good things that God has done in you and that you now and I have been given the privilege of sharing that good news to other people. We realize that he is worth sharing more than ever. And then the last thing that he tells us is the one that's hard to get our heads around, and that is this, that as we follow Jesus, he opens our eyes 
to truly trust in his timing, to truly trust in his timing. It's an amazing thing that we realize that Jesus is constantly basically telling them, trust me, trust me, trust me. You know why? I don't want to speak for you. I want to speak for me. He has to tell me over and over again, trust me, trust me. Because I, I say I trust him, but I live like I don't if I'm not careful. Because I'm always hedging my bets. I'm always trying to come up with an alternate plan just in case over and over again, which is why he didn't get mad at us. But over and over again, I need you to trust me. And that's what this statement, when he says, he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now, wait a minute. You just told us we have the honor of sharing this hope with everybody. And they do. Pretty soon, the whole world found out who Jesus was. And then in Acts chapter 2, Peter opens the door to the, to, the, to the Jewish people. And then chapter 8, he opens the world to the Gentiles. And Jesus said in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples. But in that particular moment, he said, it's not time yet. Be patient. But wait a minute. You're the one we've been waiting on. You're, you're the one. You're the guy. You, we have been waiting for so many years for the king to come. I thought you'd come a lot differently, but, but here you are now. Yes, I am. Wait, can you trust me? We got to get stuff together. We, we have to figure this out. We got to go talk to the Pharisees and find out that, to tell them that you really are the king. We got we to go try to see if we can defeat Herod and maybe one day we'll get to Caesar and all this stuff. Because remember, they believed that the Messiah was the political king that was going to come and overthrow the Roman Empire. That's who they thought the Messiah was. And he said, stop, wait, because I'm doing something so much bigger than you can imagine. You're trying to win your freedom from the Romans. I'm trying to win your freedom for eternity. You're, you're trying to so go through this thing where all of a sudden you don't have to pay taxes anymore to the Roman Empire. I'm trying to say that you don't have to pay a debt of sin anymore. But not just you, but for every single generation after you. I'm doing something so much bigger than you can imagine. So can you wait and trust me? And at the right time, you have got no idea what I'm going to do. You ain't seen nothing yet if you'll wait. And that's why God's word tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Can I tell you, that's easy when God is moving quickly. That's easy. When he says, go into all the world and make disciples, that's easy. But what about when you find out something amazing and he says, wait? What about when you find something hard and he says, wait? Can I tell you, one of the most tricky parts of this entire passage to me is not the idea that God is greater than I can imagine. He, he is. He pretty quickly exceeds my ability to comprehend. I don't know about you. I could get my head around the fact that he says that he's more powerful than I can imagine. I've seen God do amazing things, and I know you have too. I have no problem getting my mind around the idea that he is worth sharing more than I can imagine because I know what he's done in my life. And if I know he can do it in my life, I know he can do it in yours. What I have a hard time with is when he says, trust me and wait. And can I tell you, let me make it real personal. God's got a big idea for you. God's doing more in your life than you can imagine. And the more that you see what he's doing, the more it changes how you see everything else. But you know what happens to all of us? Things and stuff get in the way. Bills, families, children, parents, in-laws, work responsibilities, worries for today, fears about tomorrow, shame from our past, all these things start to get in the way. And so because we don't wanna have to sit and face those things, we just want to constantly hurry, constantly go to the next thing, constantly go to the next battle, constantly climb the next mountain, because one of the worst things to do is when we have to just sit. But can I tell you, just like my daughter, who thought that the end of the journey had happened, I had to tell her, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. We just landed. Can I tell you, I don't know where you are in your life right now, I don't know what God's doing in your life. I don't know what you're hoping for and he hasn't done yet. I don't know any of those things, but you know what I know? God's not finished with you yet. You haven't seen anything. You just landed. The question 
I've, gave my life, I've given my life to Christ. Is this all there is? Absolutely not. My hope for you is like my, my good friend, Brother Lambert, that one day you're gonna have an opportunity. You're gonna say, I've been walking with him for 50 years. And man, I wouldn't take anything for the journey I've been on. The more I walk with him, the greater he gets. God wants to open your eyes to see that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, not even has it entered into the heart, the imagination of any of us, what God has in store for all of us, that the power he works within us is greater than anything else that's out there. I don't know. Is this as free as I get? Is this all there is? You've, never, you've not seen anything yet. I feel like I'm just in a place all by myself. Can I tell you? You've not seen anything yet. And as we get ready to continue this passage of scripture, in upcoming weeks, you're gonna see Jesus as bigger and greater than you can imagine. And that king of the universe loves you. And he has a plan for your life. And as I was getting this message ready, I just felt so strongly that there were gonna be people sitting in here this morning who were going through seasons of waiting. You're going through seasons when you've heard all about the goodness of God. You've heard all about the greatness of God. You've heard all about these things. And you're like, that's all great, but I'm right here. God, is this all there is? Can I tell you? You ain't seen nothing yet, but are you willing to wait? Are you willing to stay in that space while God continues to work in your life. And if you will be patient and you will wait, you will see that he's already doing more than you can imagine. And the more you know him, the greater he becomes. The more that you see the freedom he has for you, the more powerful you see that he is. And the more you begin to do these things, you begin to see the honor of sharing and life begins to have more and more color and it's more amazing, but it all begins when you say, Jesus, I trust you. What do you need to trust the Lord with today? Let's pray together right now. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, God, that you see us and that you know us. Thank you, God, that in this place, as many people that are in this room, are the many different stories that we're processing and we're living through right now. Maybe, God, there's somebody in this place that, you know, their relationship with you is fresh and it's new and it's exciting. And Lord, hearing a message like this is just so exciting because they said, if it's this good, I can't hardly wait. But for others, maybe they're in here and they've been walking with you for a while. They've seen mountains and they've seen valleys. And they just wonder, God, if they have enough strength for another climb. Do they have enough to believe you for something else hard? I pray, God, that for them, as we worship you in a moment, you will restore the joy of their salvation. You'll remind them, God, that they're not supposed to have strength on their own. They're supposed to lean into you and that you are the one that has grace beyond understanding. And God, for maybe somebody in here today that they don't know you, they don't have a relationship with you, that God, they will hear from one beggar to another, there's life at the foot of the cross, that salvation is the joy of not just knowing that you are the king, but you are my king and you are their king. And that with that comes the power to change everything. We celebrate you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And would you stand with me all over the house? The band's getting ready to lead us in one final song of worship and to give you an opportunity to respond to what God's doing in your heart. Maybe you're here and man, you're just so excited about what God's doing in your life. And, and during our time of worship, you just need to raise your hands to the Lord and just say, Jesus, I'm just ready for the next chapter. And man, I celebrate that with you. Maybe you're in here and you're going through a season of waiting. You're trusting the Lord and you're gonna keep trusting the Lord, but it's just, you're just tired. God, you've put all of this in me. I've got all these promises in me and I gotta wait. Maybe your prayer is, God, give me the strength to realize that sometimes the greatest act of faith is faithfulness. And maybe you're in here and you don't know the Lord. Can I tell you, you've never been more loved than you are right now. God's not mad at you. He's not offended at you. He's in love with you if for no other reason so you could hear somebody tell you he's not given up on you. God's word says that he has demonstrated our great love, his great love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Inside your worship guide on the back of your connect card is the plan of salvation. Right where you are, you can read that. And if you can mean that prayer with all your heart, salvation is yours today. 
Maybe you'd like someone to pray with you about whatever's going on in your life, or maybe you've got questions about salvation. Our prayer team is in the back. We'd love to pray with you. But whatever it is, let's take a few moments and connect with the Lord today.